Hi, today I want to talk about my latest project. It's a mouthful. It's a modular RS-485 Multimaster 19-inch subrack home automation and control system. But let's start where it began. This is my desk and electronic workbench. And in this desk I have lights, these lights. So I have four lights and an LED strip. And to control these, they all have individual switches. Now I could toggle these switches or have extension cords uh, with a central switch, but that would be boring. So it started with a simple box. And this box had four relays and a driver for the LED strip. Now to control this box, I created a control panel. And I love this panel. It has haptic uh, switches, it has a clean design. I was reading on Eurorack with stacking PCBs. I really enjoyed that. And that thought continued till today, where I built a new solution, a quite over-engineered solution, a modular subrack system. So now I have a 19-inch uh, subrack or rack filled with modular uh, subrack modules or assemblies. And these are connected to nodes I have scattered around my apartment. Nodes to uh, illuminate my IKEA furniture, so Oxberg and Kallax. Nodes to drive uh, uh, relays for mains power. I have infrared and uh, RF modules to control non-connected devices. So a system to do some home automation and home control. Before we go into details, a short disclaimer. I started this project from scratch. I wanted to have the engineering challenge. There are likely way better solutions out there, professional or open source solutions. I probably didn't find the optimal solution for any of the problems I stumbled upon, but it was an interesting journey to learn stuff. So I'm sharing this with you to see how my thinking process was and how my project evolved Take it with a grain of salt. Let's start with the hardware. All the nodes and the subrack assembly are based on the same hardware setup. At its core there is an AVR64 DD32. Why did I choose this microcontroller? Well, the main reason was that I was familiar with it. I have built dev boards in the past for the uh, AVR64 series. I used them in previous projects and I had them in stock. Good reasons to, to, to use a microcontroller. Looking at the datasheet, the AVR64, as the name implies, has 64 kilobytes of flash. That's plenty of space. For example, in my setup, I'm using, I think, 16 kilobytes for the bootloader and the rest for the application code. There's plenty of room, no sweat. RAM, there are 8 kilobytes, that's great, because I will likely be handling multiple messages, I will try to buffer messages, so having a bit of RAM uh, is valuable. It runs at 24 megahertz, that's relatively quick, and it will be good enough to drive some uh, LED strips. It has two serial ports or an SPI port, so I can have an internal or uh, an RS-485 uh, uh, serial and another one for driving other components so overall this device seems to suit my needs what else do we got in the system um, we have something for the rs485 so we have a transceiver here half duplex the sp485e uh, it's a nice device on one end you have serial on the other end you have your uh, differential signal, it has ESD protection built in. Not much to say uh, about this one. Spoiler, we will later learn the half duplex is maybe not the best solution I chose. What else do we got? Um, an AP63205. So, powering the system. I'm powering the overall system with 12 volts. Um, I have quite long cables here. I think it's 30 meters or so. I, I'm not sure. Um, and I don't want to worry about uh, um, 
Voltage drop across uh, um, the cabling, so I'm powering everything with 12 volts and then step it down to 5 volts. This device here, a uh, small device, can handle up to 2 amps, easy to build, just four, 3 to 4 capacitors, an inductor, and I've put a fuse uh, on top of that. Simple device to have uh, your voltages. I don't use the 12 volts on the nodes which are in the sub rack. So if you look at my nodes, um, where do I have a node? So my typical node is a standalone thing behind some furniture. Here I'm doing the step down from 12 volts to 5 volts. If I'm doing something in the um, rack, I have a bus in here, a backplane in here, and you can hardly see it. There is a module plugged in. And I have one module here and one module over here, and these module generate the 5 volts for the overall backplane. So the uh, modules uh, inside uh, the rack don't need their own step down, saving a bit of costs and uh, hassle. Right, cabling uh, and connections. As you already saw, these are RJ45 connectors, so similar to your typical networking uh, uh, connections. I can highly recommend doing, if you ever do something with cabling, try to use existing connectors and cabling. I worked or I, I participated in an art project once where we used terminal screws and it was a hassle. Error prone, it took ages to set up. It would have been way more easier to have an RJ45 connector, just plug in some network cabling and you're done. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So I'm using standardized uh, shielded CUT67 cable for uh, my bus, um, but I have my own pinout. And that's a tip I can give as well. Use color-coded cables. So for example, in my setup, my own bus here, it has, it uses white network cables. Nothing else uh, in my apartment has white network cables. So if I stumble upon a cable behind the sofa somewhere, I know this is not real network, this is my own network. Same is true for power. I'm uh, To inject power, the 12 volts, I'm using these very simple power over Ethernet injectors. Really cheap. And I'm using 12 volts, 2 amps, so 24 watts. And they have the RG45 again because it's power over Ethernet. And I have built simple injectors uh, for my use case where I can plug in on these two sides the network, um, so my internal uh, network, and I pl can directly plug in a power over Ethernet injector into this one. For that cable, I don't use white, I use black cables. Also used nowhere else in the apartment. That way, if I'm behind furniture and I have a white and a black cable, I know that which socket to connect this to. Because the pinout of my internal bus and the power over Ethernet is different as well. And you don't want to put 24 watts into the wrong pins. Well, what else? You see a nice case here. Let's take a closer look at cases. I can highly recommend, because for my system, there are plenty of nodes, right? And they are all different. Um, I don't have a picture with all the nodes. Um, but le let's take a look at this one. So we always have connectors for the uh, bus system, but then there are application specific connectors. So here there is a, a pluggable terminal. Uh, maybe there are different sizes. Uh, so I need different cutouts at different positions and I could build each case individually. But what I did is I used OpenSCAD and I can highly recommend that. And parameterized um, my cases. So I can specify width and length, 
the uh, distance of these standoffs and then I can uh, create, tell it to create my box and then which cutouts I need. And with this way I can easily generate multiple cases for multiple use cases where I know they will work out. The only thing I need to know is where to position a cutout. If I measure that right on the PCB, uh, I can add the numbers here and I know the case I will produce works like a charm. In the beginning I 3D printed those on my Creality uh, 3D printer, um, but uh, after the first ones were correct, I actually sent off an order to a uh, 3D print house to create all these boxes for me because I need, I don't know, 15 or something and it's dirt cheap to have something 3D printed. I can highly recommend that. Let's go back to the PCB and take a look at KiCat. Um, let's start with the schematic. <coughs> schematic is super easy because as you saw there's not much happening on these devices. So there's the AVR, a bit of capacitors, a connector to flash via UPDI. There are our RJ45 connectors for the bus. There is our SP485. Yes, it says 481, but it's a SP485. Um, as our transceiver. There is a section for powering uh, the node. So the standard setup as recommended in the data sheet, plus a, a fuse and an additional capacitor. And the only thing which is really application specific in this case, and I mean I chose it because it's the simple, simplest one, is that I have another connector um, for driving a button and an LED because it's exactly this one here. There's just one button connected, so it's a super simple setup. But more or less, no, open, more or less, this setup is the same on all nodes, with the ex exception for the subrecs where the power is uh, not needed because the power, as I showed you, is coming through the backplane. And of course, there are no RJ45 connectors, but rather a DIN connector um, to fit into the backplane. Let's take a look at the board. I don't think there's anything spectacular here, but let's take a look at the 3D viewer. Let's reset that. So a few things um, I can recommend is put something on the board which identifies what kind of board this is. This is obvious but I saw quite a lot of boards where there is no markings whatsoever. And if you put a name on there, also put a revision on there. So you know, oh this one is the in this case the first revision I'm using letters. Um, so you have clarity around what version you have. I'm also adding uh, my GitHub links there, so I know where the whole package resides. If I want to look something up, I uh, know where to go to. <laughs> then also not very uh, sophisticated, have any uh, um, connections labeled, so you know without looking into the schematic uh, how to connect, connect things in the future. And if we remove the components, you will see a few things which are not standard in KiCad. I'm adding these dots uh, when I place an IC to help me the, to find the orientation. Yes, KiCad has these lines, so the longer line indicates uh, the pin zero, uh, pin one, or here this uh, longer thing. But I really like to having a dot somewhere to make that clearer. And here we have a tantalum capacitor. I'm always adding a line uh, on here which uh, matches the line on the printing on the case of the capacitor. So I'm clear which side is up. Let's flip this around. A few more things I did. I have a silk screen here for a device ID. So we will later see that all devices or all these nodes I have will have an individual de uh, device ID. And in this area, I have something where with a Sharpie I can put in the device ID. Really helps when you're debugging and have five of these boards on your desk and you're unsure which one is which. 
And also in the cases I've built, um, can you see that here? There is this window here, and this window is exactly for this device ID, so you can always see, see that. Then I have documented the pinout of the RJ45 um, connector. So if I need to debug something, I know uh, which pin is which. Um, maybe not really helpful in this scenario, but uh, what I would like to highlight is I often see boards where it just says VCC and ground. And then you have to dig through documentation to figure out if this board runs on 5 volts or on 3.3 uh, volts. So I can highly recommend to always specify the exact voltage you need. The last thing I often do is if I have mounting holes, I put the distance of these mounting holes uh, uh, on the board. So when I want to uh, uh, drill some holes, I know the exact distance without needing to measure it. And sometimes I also put in the diameter or the, the intended uh, screw, like M4 in this case, I think, uh, on there as well. A few words on the rack assembly. So as you know, the rack assembly, it's all standardized. Um, the PCBs are standardized. They are 160 by 100 uh, millimeters, the Euro format. You can buy a... a a rack enclosure with uh, uh, all the mounting uh, brackets, that's all standard. The only thing I did was I created my own backplane. And for that backplane, I have uh, RJ45 connectors again to uh, inject the bus. And I have DIN connectors for each of the uh, subrack assemblies. Now I chose to use the smaller uh, connectors. I think they are called C3 and not the full size because I wanted to have these cutouts for two reasons. One is these are my audio uh, modules and here I wanted to be able to directly plug in TRS connectors. So I needed an opening if the connector, if the DIN connector would be full size, uh, it would be cramped. And I wanted to have um, the UPDI connector for flashing uh, uh, accessible on the back and that helps here as well with the cutout. Um, if you look at the module, it's similar to uh, the um, nodes we've spoken about. You see the microcontroller, there's no power uh, on here because it's generated uh, by the module in the, uh, in the backplane. You have the DIN connector and you have a standard setup where you have uh, some brackets to uh, connect the front panel. Maybe a bit uh, special, in the beginning I created individual cards for each use case, but quickly I figured out I could just build a generic uh, base card um, and just populate connectors as needed, because at the core all the Subrack modules are similar. They have a few switches uh, or buttons uh, in the front. They have a few encoders. So this could be standardized and uh, I use the same generic base card for most of the modules. So it's only the microcontroller and the uh, RS485 transceivers, uh, transceiver uh, and then have, depending on the use case, different connectors plugged in towards a customized front plate. The audio um, subrack assembly is the most complex one because I'm actually doing a bit more things here. I have a Bluetooth module connected. I have some relays to switch the audio uh, uh, between the TRS uh, connections in the front and in the back. Um, so this is the only real one where a generic base doesn't make sense. So it uses a uh, specific, uh, use case specific um, assembly. Let's talk about the interesting part, the low level communication. So in this example scenario, we have three nodes. One node has buttons, one node has relays, and one node has LEDs. All these nodes have a microcontroller and this microcontroller has a serial port and that is connected to the 485 transceiver. 
and the transceivers are connected via a bus. Simple design. Now the beauty uh, of this 485 buses or these transceivers, they are transparent. On one side you put in serial, on the other side the differential signal is generated and it's decoded and spits out serial again. So from a system perspective or from a microcontroller perspective, this is just serial communication. We can send bytes across this bus. And the microcontroller, because they have hardware support for serial, is doing all the heavy lifting. So timing, detecting frames, all this stuff, it's all handled. For us, it's super simple. We can just put in bytes and receive bytes. Based on that, we could build the world's simplest communication protocol. And let's do that. So let's say we have a message which consists of a single byte. We could define that when I press a button and I want to turn something on, that this is indicated by the byte E1. It gets from serial uh, transmitted, translated, goes to the bus, is uh, translated again back to serial and the main relay node will receive an E1. And it, the node is configured to listen for E1s and turn on a relay. Mission accomplished. The E1 of course also travels through the bus to the LED. This node is configured to ignore E1s. It doesn't care. It knows that E1s, that's not a message uh, for an LED node. Uh, let's ignore them. Super simple. And the same thing could be done with E0s. So same scenario, it travels through the bus, goes here, and the relay turns something off. A very simple solution. Of course, it's not a perfect solution. Let's say we want to have LEDs and for that we have an E2 command. So E2 command is defined, if I press a button it goes through the bus, again it goes through the relay but the relay doesn't care about E2 commands, ignores them and the LED node receives an E2 command, is configured to listen to E2s and puts an LED to red. Awesome. So now our protocol has 256 different available commands because we have one byte. That is quite limiting, right? I, do I really want to have LEDs where I have to pre-program the colors or brightnesses or whatever? That seems to be flawed. Maybe I want to have quite a lot of nodes with different commands and they all share the same command. It, 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 it's not that great. Let's try to make that better. How about we extend our message to include a recipient and each of our nodes has an address. So this node has the address of C0, C1, C2. Now if we do the same thing, do the same thing. We press a button and we no longer send one byte but two bytes. And the first one is the address. So on the bus, let's go to the LED first. It receives a C1 command. It knows its own address is C0. Doesn't match, is ignored. The relay box knows that it's C1, so it knows how to process uh, or is, uh, knows that it should uh, act on those and can interpret the E1. Awesome, that's way better. Now, that's nice and very functional, so we have our 256 bytes for commands can now be duplicated, right? because the turn the LED red command could be E1 as well, because we would, if we send that command, no longer send it to C1, but to C0. So it goes through the bus, this guy would ignore it because it's the wrong address, this guy would act on it and put, turn the LEDs red. That's better. Um, so now we have 256 commands per node. 
a bit more flexibility. Awesome. Now, debugging. It's cool to have addresses because it makes debugging way easier. If you have a bus system and you sniff the, the bus to figure out what's happening and you just see E1s or whatever the messages are, it's very confusing. You don't know uh, who this is sent to. You have to know all that in uh, or look it up somewhere. Very difficult. With the address already, it's easy. You can look up, oh yeah, is this message for this device? I can easily uh, look that up. But to make it a bit better for debugging, let's add a from field as well. So, um, Let's add a field to say this is coming from C2. So now we have a from field. Yeah, our message is three bytes long now. Um, from C2 to C1 and the message or the command is E1. So we press the button, it goes the old way. This guy ignores it, wrong address. This guy receives it and interprets it. Now, if we debug on the bus, we clearly see which device or which node has sent something. That makes life so much easier because it's confusing when you see messages and you don't know where they uh, originate from. I can strongly recommend that. And in addition, having a from address means we can act on messages. So let's say we send this E1 command, which means turn something on. And we want to get an acknowledgement for this command. So this guy could, send, uh, could then create a message and let's say the acknowledgement is, I don't know, F1. This guy could construct a message because he knows who was the sender and create an acknowledgement message, send that off to the bus. This guy would ignore it again, wrong recipient. This guy would receive it and knows, yes, the button press did actually change the relay. It makes life so much easier to have a from and a to address. Now, um, that's nice, but it's still one byte for a command that's not really feasible for what I want to achieve here. Because we could press uh, all the use cases into this one byte, but at the end I want to do, for example, flashing, uh, 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 firmware flashing through the bus. One byte is not long enough. So I want to have multiple bytes, um, like this here. So, for multiple, to have multiple bytes, um, we have a few decisions we could take. Um, we could define a fixed length message and say, oh, all our messages are always, as you see here, have three bytes. Doesn't matter what kind of message you're sending, it's always three. We extend those with padding bytes. Um, and it's always three bytes. Easy solution, but of course, quite a lot of waste. In my case, the longest message I want to send are 67 bytes, I think, for firmware updates. So that would mean if you have this fixed length, that every message has 67 bytes, even though for a relay, probably this one byte with E1 is well enough. That's not great. What else could we do? Um, we could have dynamic length. We could say all messages going to C1 are always one byte long and every message going to C0 are three bytes long or we could tie the length to the type of command. That's all possible. But it all means that all nodes on the bus need to know all other nodes and understand how their command structure looks like. I want to be extendable, not a good solution for me. So let's ignore all that. 
let's say we do dynamic length. Oh, it's the wrong color here, I think. Is this purple? Hmm. Okay. Um, we want to add a length field because we want to add more bytes. So um, let's add this here. From two, let's add a length here and say. Somehow the color doesn't seem to. Ah, no, no, it's correct. Um, Okay, let's have this message now. Yeah, that's where the color went. Um, so if you press a button, we generate a message which says this message is four bytes long. First byte, and it contains a recipient, the sender, and a command. Same deal, this guy receives it, and it now knows because it's four bytes long, that there is a single command in here. Now construct a better or a more interesting message. Um, tuck, tuck. Two, three, four, five, six. So we have a message. This is for the LED. It's from this guy. All right, that was wrong here. It was like this. Um, I think. No, it's okay because it's first from then to. Uh, confusing my own protocol. Awesome. Okay, now I have a command which says if I press this button, it's six bytes long, it's from this person or this node, it goes to the LEDs and it has, because it's six bytes long, three command bytes. I'm no longer ca calling them command bytes, I'm calling the first thing command byte and then uh, options or uh, uh, an additional payload. So now this LED guy or node could be interpreting this. Yes, it's the correct address. Um, it's three bytes, so this could be an RGB value. Spoiler, don't use RGB. Uh, maybe later uh, I will say a bit more about that. So this is great um, and it should work. Is there anything else missing or what else could we do here? Um, well, you already see here in the serial definition, I'm using 500 kilo board, so half a mega board, and I'm using a configuration of 8N1. That means I have a start bit, I have eight data bits, no parity bit and one stop bit. That means there is no way of detecting errors in a frame because I don't use this parity bit. I could use it, but then it's one bit wasted per, uh, per byte or frame I'm sending. That means bytes can flip. There could be noise on the uh, bus. A byte could flip, I wouldn't recognize that or detect that. And the obvious thing to do is, of course, add a CRC checksum. So I'm adding a CRC8 checksum to uh, every message. Let's try that. I think that's red again. And I don't know how this one looks, so just 
put a placeholder in here. And this would have been Claro. So now this is how a message should look like. If I press a button, it's the length, it's the addressing part, it's the actual command with its payload, and it's a CRC checksum. Ah yeah, one thing, why is the length including everything? We could define it and say, oh, the length is only these two, these zeros here, which is in addition. I liked it to have the length to be including the length field to be at the start containing the whole message because then in my stack when I handle a message which is more or less looking like this uh, in the code I know the first byte is always the size of the complete buffer. Yes I'm doing checks um, so there is no uh, buffer overflow but um, this way it's easy to handle uh, the buffer because it delivers its size information as a first byte. Okay, so we can send these messages now. If there is an error and the checksum is wrong, uh, a node can detect it um, uh, and discard a message. Um, if the checksum is correct, it can process that directly. Cool. Now, this could be a quite reliable and flexible protocol. We have addressing, we have dynamic length, we have one byte of that payload being configured as a command, so 256 different commands in here. We have a checksum to make it reliable. It's a quite uh, well-defined protocol. But there is still a problem. Let's assume we have the bus and we have three messages being sent. And let's assume there is noise on the bus for whatever reason. And the noise Draw IO is interesting sometimes. Come on. Oh, yeah. And the noise. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the no. Oh, this thing is killing me. Okay, just assume. That's better. So, uh, and the noise is happening inside here. So we have all these devices and they listen to the bus. They received, oh, let's read six bytes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then this is two C0, so the LED thing will do something. And everyone on the bus will now assume that the next message starts here at C0 because they didn't read these bytes. They were just told to read six bytes and then the next message will start. Mm, that's terrible. And the next message is a length of C0, so quite long, so it will skip over all of this. Um, and you will never find a start start a correct start of a message again that's a terrible system so so far the system relies on that everything works perfectly all the time there's never an error there is never uh, a situation where there's noise where uh, a message is broken somehow you can't heal it anymore that's not good design the other scenario by the way is a device is powered on and it's powered on while it's in a message. So the first byte it reads is FF. That would be the length of the message. Terrible. Same deal, it can't recover from such a situation because it doesn't know when the next message starts. 
for that um, there are of course multiple possible solutions um, and I've picked one and maybe I should have gone with a different one but I have a solution I, uh, I'm using now so we could for example do a timing based solution and say between a message there is always a certain time of silence let's say 10 milliseconds so every node no every node knows if there's for 10 milliseconds there is no data on the bus it means a new message starts actually a quite simple thing to do um, I didn't like it, I didn't want to have timers uh, uh, in my uh, protocol stack. Spoiler, I have timers in my protocol stack. Um, but this could easily be detected and uh, we know every time a message starts once there was 10 milliseconds silence. But of course, that also means every message has a 10 millisecond silence, so um, the the throughput of the bus is reduced. Not really important for my use case, but just keep it in mind. So I didn't like this solution because of the dealing with timers. Um, I didn't think this was uh, a way to go. Then what else could be done? Um, we said we are using standard serial communication and we've configured this for 8N1. What we have could done is configure this for 9n1 so we could say um, we are no longer treating a byte as 8 bits but as 9 bits and the AVR can handle that uh, uh, in its hardware so uh, that's not a problem and we could say if this bit here is set to 1, it's the first bit of a message. So we could say if that bit here is 1, it's a start. And the same is true here and here. And for all the rest The highest bit would be zero. So that would be a quite nice solution because we can listen on the bus, we can read a message and if we expect a new start and the uh, ninth bit is set we know ah, it's the start of a message. If it's zero we know it's somewhere in between uh, so we are outside of the start of a message and just need to wait until we see the ninth bit being uh, set to one. Very easy to do. I didn't do it. Um, I wasn't sure at that point what I wanted to connect to the bus. Um, I was afraid, even though many systems understand nine data bits, not all do. So maybe I have hardware which can't handle nine bits. Um, so having this as the protocol could prevent me from extending this with certain hardware where I can't send a ninth, ninth bit. In practice, everything is on the bus so far is with the AVR64, so I could have done it. It's probably easy to do. I think one downside is that the libraries, uh, at least in MPLAB, um, don't really handle uh, a 9-bit configuration, so you have to do some things manually, but it's a good solution, I think. But of course, you would lose one bit for every byte you're sending, right? So there is overhead to that, but there's always some kind of overhead. So what else could we do? Well, the thing I, I did... Um, maybe not the cleverest... Uh, solution but it's the way I'm doing it. I would like to have a start condition. So I want messages to start with a specific byte. Um, let's see how to 
get rid of all these additional things. So I have these messages and I have, is that red as well? Yeah, uh, a start condition, which of course, what else would you choose is 42. So that's way better. So now if I'm a node, I can listen for the byte value 42. And if it's 42, I know a new message has started. Well, unfortunately, not so easy. Not sure if I prepared it here. No, I didn't. Um, because the 42 could be also in the payload, or it could be the checksum, or it could be an address. And of course, you can try to prevent these things. You could say, um, let's make the 42 unique in each message. It's not allowed to have a message with 42 bytes. If it's 42 bytes, it has to be 43 bytes. We don't allow addresses to be 42. We don't allow a command of 42. We don't or we move data from 42 to 43. For example, in an LED case, do I really see a difference in the green channel if it's 42 or 43? I doubt it. And if it's a checksum of 42, we just increase it to 43. We could all we could do these things. But where it's already starting to be difficult is let's assume this is a firmware update. And does my firmware contain 42? Does it make a difference if the opcode is 43 now? Oh, that's probably not good. So just having 42 is not that great. Um, I mean, we can still try to use it and detect that this is the start of a message. So as we've seen earlier, if a device uh, or if um, the bus is uh, uh, interrupted for some time, we could wait for the next 42 or if a device is powered on somewhere uh, in here, it could watch for the next 42 and try to heal itself. But there is a chance that the 42 is used somewhere else. So that's not a great solution. So how did I challenge that? Um, I did some kind of escaping. So what I said is, if there's a 42 and it's a start condition, then it is always followed by the byte 99. So 42 is never alone. It's always 42 and 99. Okay, that doesn't just assume this. So if a 42 comes and is followed by a 99, this means it's a start condition, the start of a message. If it's followed by a 66, it means this is a real 42. It's not a start condition, but it's somewhere in the payload. So if this would be 42, then it would be followed by a 66. And if it's anything else, Besides 99 and 66, something has gone horribly wrong. This is an error similar to as if the CSC checksum didn't uh, work out. So if we look at this, um, we have the raw data on the bus and what my stack sees. So on the bus, we have a 42 and 99. We know it's a start condition. My stack just acts on it and says, OK, this is a message, message start. We have the length, in this example, seven bytes. We have from a device. And for unfortunate reasons, uh, it's to device 42. So the 42 is followed by a 66, not a 99. So we know it's a real 42. When my stack processes this message, it filters out the 66. So the stack directly receives the correct address, 42. We receive a command, uh, which again has a 42. Um, followed by a 66, so it's a, uh, a valid uh, 42, followed by a 23, so the uh, stack will at the end put out uh, 42, 23. And a checksum, which I didn't calculate here, 
to check the integrity of this message. So with that, we have quite a stable protocol, um, which has start detection. So it doesn't matter if a device is randomly booted at some random point while a message is going on, or if there's noise on the bus and the message is destroyed and we can recover because we can search for 42 in combination with 99. Of course, it makes sense to choose your start condition value wisely. Uh, don't use values which are often used. So I don't know, uh, 0, 0, 0, 001, FF, uh, values you have often uh, in your messages will always extend the message by another byte. So the drawback here with this uh, variant is that the messages have different length. So you don't know how long a message is on the bus. It could be longer because you have lots of 42s in your message. But that's a, uh, 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 but I'm accepting that um, that is still helpful. So this is the low level uh, part I was thinking about. Um, right. Before we jump into playing around with real devices in a terminal program, let's go back to the addressing scheme. In our example here, we randomly assign C0, C1, C2 as the addresses. In my system, I have defined a bit more functionality for addressing. And it's similar to what you would know from, for example, TCP IP, I guess. So let's take a look at some documentation I created because I have an address do uh, documentation. So I defined that there is a special address 00, zero which means nobody is listening to this. Uh, you can use it to send, for example, debug, uh, debug notifications uh, on the bus and you know nobody will ever listen to these devices. Then I have unicast addresses, so point to point, similar as we did in these examples. Um, they are from 0 02 to EF, so our C0, C1, uh, etc. And there's a special unicast address, which is the default address. So if a device, a node, is not configured uh, with an address, it will automatically assume address 01. That makes debugging life easier again. If you see a 01 somewhere, you know, oh, something is wrong, I didn't provision a device, it doesn't have an address, um, it's easy to detect. And then I created, let's start at the top, a broadcast, FF. This is an address. If the to field has uh, FF, all devices will listen to this. And this will later play a role because I have commands for all devices. For example, if I want to reset all devices, reboot them, I can send it to everyone. And then I created broadcast groups. Um, I could call it multicast, I guess, uh, not exactly true, but uh, so a group of devices. Um, I have devices from F1 to FE, and by that I can group devices, for example, sending a firmware update. Uh, if I have multiple mains relay nodes, I could address them in one group. Or if I have multiple LED strips, I could send them all the command to turn on red or off or whatever uh, the command is. And I have a default broadcast group similar to the unicast one. If it hasn't been configured, everyone is listening to the F0 uh, broadcast group. So my easy address I had here is not exactly correct. So let's say Actually, the nodes have two addresses. They have a unicast address, C2, and they also have a broadcast address. So I think this one has no, it's not listening to anyone. And the relays are all in group F2, and the LEDs are all in group F3. So if I have my previous messages, for example here, this one being sent to the LED, C0, it could also be addressed to F3, and it would also reach the LEDs, or multiple nodes of these LEDs. 
Now with this addressing scheme in place, um, the question is where do we store these addresses? How does a node know which address it has to use? I wanted to have a system without a central unit. So I didn't want a system like DHCP or where I have dynamic address uh, allocation. I want each device to be provisioned. So each device needs to store where this in this case C0 and F3 uh, uh, is assigned to. And looking at the microcontroller, there are a few obvious places to store information. So first of all, it could be stored somewhere in the source code, right? If I uh, compile a LED node, it could say I am C0 uh, and in group F3. That's okay if you have one node of one type, but if I have five LED nodes, I don't want to compile the uh, source code five times or patch the address in the source code and have it hard coded. I don't like this solution. The other possibility, which is the obvious one, back to the browser, is to store it in the EEPROM, of course. So uh, almost all microcontrollers have an EEPROM. This one has 256 bytes, so I could store the information in the EEPROM. That would be a completely valid solution, but I don't like this either. Um, first of all, I will use the EEPROM for other stuff. So the size will, re will be reduced of the EEPROM because I need to store addresses. They are certain uh, fixed uh, location then, which I can't use for other stuff. If I flash it, I often overwrite the EEPROM because something has changed. Maybe my code uh, runs wild and destroys data in the EEPROM by accident and then my provisioning doesn't work out. I don't like the, the idea of using the EEPROM, at least for, for the provisioning for the address. What I'm doing instead is I am using the so-called user row. So the AVR64 and other AVR devices have a another EEPROM. It's just 32 bytes long, but you can flash it as you could flash EEPROM, but it's not affected by uh, uh, the, the EEPROM. If you flash the, uh, an AVR device and specify that the EEPROM should be wiped, the user row isn't. So it's a completely separate area while in practice it's still an EEPROM. And I'm storing my uh, provisioning data of each node in this special user row. How am I doing that? Well, let's see. Um, I have written a tool for user rows. So I have a tool where I can say I need to create a provisioning uh, file for a device and it needs a board type, a board revision, a device address, a device group and data. Okay, let's try this. Um, the obvious ones are device address. In our example, it was C0 um, and a device group. We said that this is F3 data, which I'm actually not using. Um, maybe I will use that in the future, but there is more here. Um, board type and board revision. And why this is useful, we will see later on when I play around with real devices. But let's check out the doc. There is a board tab. So all my boards have an ID. Uh, and spoiler, that I can recognize what kind of uh, hardware is talking uh, to me. If I done something wrong in provisioning or I'm not sure, I can always check and see, okay, I don't know if that's a board uh, 05, it's the uh, main node uh, I have. So let's add that. Uh, let's say this is, an, oh no, we said it's an LED strip, right? So an LED strip would be seven. And then there is a board revision. So all my uh, 
PCBs I'm creating have a board revis revision. I typically do that from A to Z. Uh, hopefully I will never reach Z. Um, and I can specify those as well. If I run this, a Intel hex file, iHex file uh, is created because you can flash uh, the user row area of the AVR64 as any uh, flash area uh, using an iHex file. It just contains the content, so board type 7, A uh, translated is 41, C0, F3 and everything else is empty because I don't use any specific data. So with this file uh, I can now flash my device uh, and the address is now stored in the device in this user row which is a bit more uh, reliable is the wrong word but it doesn't get overwritten by accident Let, let's say it that way um, i can highly recommend to work uh, when you want to work with ihex files to use python they have a great library for uh, uh, ihex support with ihex support it's super easy to generate uh, flash content and I will use that later on uh, for generating uh, firmware update files. Okay, having done that, we can actually provision it the device and the device then will listen to exactly those addresses being specified. Cool. Now to the fun part playing with the system. So, um, let's open a terminal program. So this is now a serial terminal uh, connected to one of the first nodes I built. Again, for debugging purposes, it's great to have uh, tools and hardware in place to directly interact with the bus. So it was the first thing I did. And let's play around. So in the beginning, my firmware for this gateway, although this USB gateway, um, expected all the bytes. So if I wanted to send a message, it really was uh, expected to have a 42, 99, 6 and so on, uh, as we've seen before. Because that way I could debug and work on the uh, original stack where I needed to test is the, are things working as expected, right? So if the checksum is wrong, what is happening if the length is wrong, does the system work? Once I achieved a, a stack which worked out of the box, I removed all that and made the terminal interaction way easier. And the interaction looks like this. Um, I just have to specify uh, the to address. So if we look here, to and the command. Let's do that. Let's say I'm sending this to 00, zero with the command 00. zero. Two we already know. Let's check the doc. And bring that over. So address zero zero it means nobody will listen to this. Okay, so I can't do anything wrong. And the command I'm using is zero zero. As you will expect, it's a no op command. For the for the commands, I have documented all the commands here as well. Um, there is a command here zero zero. It doesn't take any additional bytes and it's doing nothing. Nope. Okay, so let's send nothing to nobody. Okay, um, so we did something um, and this is to get familiar with how the output of uh, my gateway looks like. So all lines start with KS00. So for a KHA stack, um, a message type 00. This is helpful if you interact uh, from code with the terminal you can easily filter out message and say if it's a, if a line starts with KS00, this is either sending or receiving a message. So it's easy to work with uh, tools and process this line by line. What did we do? So we have a TX command. We sent something onto the bus, uh, a message with five bytes. So length is five. 
from E1, so my uh, terminal program here is E1, similar to the command we used here, but that doesn't matter. Um, 200, zero, zero, that is what we expected. Um, I added for debug purposes as well uh, the address type, so 00, zero is nobody. Uh, okay, a command of 00, zero, which gets translated or in a readable format is nop, and there is something at the end. Let's see. Let's extend that and add some data. So, um, now I have a similar message to nobody, no command, but then there are additional bytes. And as we have learned here on, on the draw IO, um, the message changes, so the length is now eight, so three bytes more, not surprising, still from E1 to 00, zero. Um, no command, and you see if there are additional bytes besides the command, so this command here, if there are optional bytes, they are displayed in these brackets. That's how the how to read this terminal. I don't show the checksum. If the checksum is wrong, it will uh, print out the message. Um, and I don't show the start condition or the bytes. As I said in the beginning, I had those in here, but for readability reasons, I filter them out. How does it look like if I receive a message? Well, we can use my terminal here again. In So I have actually two USB gateways uh, connected to my system. One is on my PC to play around and one is connected to my home server. And I have a script here which sends via UDP a packet to my home server which then translates it to the USB gateway which will then send it onto the bus. So let's send the same message through that, that setup. Cool. It didn't receive it because I used the space and I didn't filter, don't filter out spaces there. Um, so another message, still KS00 to detect, easily detected via code. Um, then this time, this gateway here received a message, length five from E0. So this USB gateway here is E1. My USB gateway connected to my server is E0. It was sent to nobody. The command was 00, zero and there was no additional bytes included. So that's how the system works. You have RXTX. I, I think it's quite obvious. Now let's look into the command list. Um, there are tons of interesting commands to use um, and again tons of decisions to make how to handle and work with commands. One of the first commands I created was a ping command. Um, let's see, where are we here? Yeah, a ping command. So the command is E3, no data. So let's ping somebody. Let's ping this other gateway. E0, so we're sending something to E0. We sent a ping command. And we sent a ping and received a pong. So we sent from E1 to E0 command E3 and we received the other way around a E4 command which is a pong. So similar to the example we used earlier here with the acknowledgement, the ping and pong works now. Cool. One of the interesting decisions here was how to structure the commands. I could have used or what you see here is E3 is the ping command. Okay, what about the pong, so the response? I could have reused the E3 and put a payload, for example, in here, which says this is the pong to a ping. But across my commands, I usually have now split things up into multiple commands. So if there's a response to something, it's its own command. I think it's better for readability. 
I'm not sure if there's really cons or pros, but that's the way I did it. So you will often see a, uh, two commands, even though this could have been done through payloads. Um, so ping and pong. I already spoiled earlier, there is a command to reset or reboot any device. Reboot device. And the command is ff. Let's do that. And let's do it with another device. I don't want to reboot the gateway, actually. Um, now, how do I find the device? Well, I have a tab where I have all my devices listed. It tells me what the unicast addresses are for each device and in which uh, device group they are located in. So earlier, we talked about LED stuff, so let's do that, C0, and reboot that device. C0, command was FF. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, we send out a reboot. That's straightforward. And we received an up, and we received another up, both from the C0 device. What's happening here? Well, um, this is again, uh, as you probably uh, grasp already, I try to do a lot of things to make debugging more easy. When my device boots, it will always send an up message. That way I know that the device has rebooted on the bus or something, if I didn't want to do that, uh, something terrible went wrong. Uh, or if I wanted to do it to see, ah yeah, okay, it's, is it the correct device? Is the provisioning of the address is correct and so on. So that's why there is an up command. Um, and then there are quite a few bytes in the optional part here. And let's see what they are doing. So on first sight, they are quite identical, except for 00, zero and zero 01 here. All the rest is the same. Let's see if we can figure out what all these things mean. Um, So, the 6.5 here and the 6.5 here, they are quite, so at least they start with the similar number. What these are is the compile time of the bootloader, that's the first number, and the compile time of the application code. That's the Unix timestamp. And after that is a checksum, so a CRC32 of the bootloader code and the application code. And these values are, well, the compile time is generated at compile time, no surprise, um, but the CRC checksum is calculated each time a device boots. So I can check that um, all the devices I have uh, have the correct firmware on them. Now let's try this with a bit more devices. We saw earlier I have multiple of these strips and they are all in the group F1. So let's send a reboot not to a single device but to a group. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's now four devices as I would expect because I have four devices and it's following a similar pattern. So from device C3, C0, C1, C2 and they seem to have all the same bootloader with the same bootloader code, the same application uh, uh, with the same application code. Cool. The values beforehand they are still the same except for this 01. So let's take a look. Um, F1, good guess, yes, it's their uh, device group. So I know their address because they sent uh, data uh, from an address, so I already know that, but I don't know to which device group they might listen to, so that's included in here. Then there is a 02, uh, 02, let's see if we find a 02 here. Oh, in our board list, it says 02 is an IKEA node. 
an LED IKEA node. So the board type we configured in our provisioning earlier is being sent when a device is rebooted. And 43 is the board revision. If you remember, we've put something in here. We always said, oh, first thing is the board type, then there is the board revision. 43 is C, so unfortunately I had to redo this PCB a few times. But now I know what kind of board uh, has booted here. And the last bytes here, our byte is 00, zero and then it's zero 01 and it's repeated. This indicates to me if it's zero, 00, it means the bootloader has started or the stack has been initialized while being in the bootloader. And after four seconds, the bootloader will um, uh, switch to the application code and then the stack is reinitialized and then it will send another up message uh, telling me now application code is running. I should have no, uh, named that AA and BB, uh, BB and AA, but I have 00 and 01. That way I know when a device, for example, is endless booting and I see it coming up again and again, if it's stuck in the bootloader, if the application code is executed, it just helps me debugging my system. And it explains why there is a pause between these messages because the bootloader waits for four seconds and we will see later on why. Um, and if nobody wants to interact with that bootloader, it switches to the application code. Cool, so this is really basic communication working. Now let's see what we have in our command list, what we can do as well. So we rebooted the device. Um, uh, stats. Um, we could ask these devices F1 E5 for some stats. Um, they are not really much information yet because they just have been rebooted. So what the stat request is doing, it asks the, the uh, protocol stack how many messages have, have been received, how many messages have been sent so far. So now it should be one more. Yes. Um, and if there were any errors. So was there a CSC checksum failure? Um, was there a missing start condition? Was I unable to send a message because uh, the length exceeds the, the maximum uh, being specified? Just some statistics to figure things out. I will later on talk about uh, collision detection. Um, unfortunately, there, will, there are collisions in my system sometimes. So let's ask all devices for stats and that sometimes generates a collision. Let's see. No, but if I ask all my devices, you see that the receiving part here, nobody had any collisions so far. Oh, and sending was also fine. Also, no errors have occurred since I last reset it. So I have a command to reset the statistics to zero. Um, no, that was the wrong one. This one was um, sending the up. Uh, information again so you see all devices now they almost all have the same bootloader there are some different versions where I probably tried something out and you can see that for example three devices have the same application code there so they are likely the same board yeah um, it was not e4 but it's I guess e3 let's check no, it is E7. So that's clear. All stats have been cleared. So that's quite nice to, to interact uh, with your devices. So far, we looked at what I would call management commands. Ping, pong, reset, statistics, uh, etc. These are all device management. 
The more interesting part is actually working with the devices. Now in our earlier example on the board, we had defined some commands here. E1 is to turn a relay on, E0 is to turn a relay off. And that's a viable approach. We could have node specific commands like we did here, uh, where sometimes E1 is turning a relay on or uh, E1 could also be change an LED, um, depending on to whom this message is sent to. That wasn't the approach I took. I was, or I implemented a register based approach. You can imagine that, that every device has a, a or multiple registers uh, and you can access these registers through register commands. And depending on the device, each register has a different functionality. Let's take a look at how this is defined. I have a list of all my devices and what their registers do. So I want to play around now with my audio. So I have a module which is called BGT Audio and it has a device register, ignore the preset for now, um, where one the first register is select the audio source destination, the second one is in something with Bluetooth and the third one is to configure which source or destination is selected on power up. Okay, so let's try to play with this a bit. So let's find the audio board. I want to use the audio out for now, which is B2. Um, let's get the terminal. So a command to B2. Then we want to work with registers. So let's take a look at the commands. So I have a few register commands. I can read a register. I can receive a reply to that read. Okay, that makes sense. I can write to a register. I can write to a register without wanting a re reply and I can receive a message if the write was successful or if it failed. These are the basic commands to interact with any node uh, on an application uh, uh, layer. We just access uh, registers inside the node. So let's try to read something. Um, the command is D0. Okay, let's make this a bit smaller. So to device B2, D0, and then there is a payload, so there are an optional bytes. The first one is from which address? Let's start at zero. And how many bytes do I want to read? If we look again into the register, we said, oh, there are actually three bytes which are device thingies. So let's try to read three bytes. So they're all zero, awesome. Um, so I requested to read from address zero, three bytes, and I received a response which says, from address zero, these are the three bytes, zero, zero, zero. Okay. Um, let's check what do they mean? Audio source, power on, and Bluetooth. So everything is in its default state. Let's try to manipulate this. There is a write command. Um, and the write command is D5. So to device B2, I want to write something. I want to write just the first byte. And that was the source. Let's change that source. Um, now do some magic. This is the rack. So, ah, oh, you can't see my mouse pointer, right? Okay. So this one is the audio. Left side is input, right side is output. We want to man manipulate the output part here. The first register 
select audio source destination. AUX A, B, C and D, and I know the first one is A, B, C and D, or I hope it is. Um, and let's switch it from my headphones to my soundbar. So uh, that's exactly what we have as a command and let's see what happens. Ooh, quite a lot of things happens. So the first thing you noticed, you might have heard the relay click, um, that the thing changed from headphones to soundbar. So exactly uh, what we anticipated. Um, so we did, we did a write request, okay. We received a write okay, so it, it worked. And the B2 asked or broadcasted to itself that it changed uh, a setting. I need that for others to sniff uh, on the bus and see that this changed. And it also sent to another device, C5, uh, let's figure that out in a second, uh, another write with a no response. It doesn't want to acknowledge that. Let's see what a C5 is. Um, addresses, C5. Ah, it's a, a relay node. So because my soundbar is connected to a relay box, this, uh, this thing here decided because it was asked to go to the soundbar to enable the relay box of the soundbar. Oh, you can't see it. This one is green here now. Uh, it's a bit dim. Um, so there was an interaction between these. Cool. Now let's read again the register. Same as uh, above. Um, read three bytes. So the first one is the address. It's from zero, zero. And now the source is one. Cool, so we manipulated the register and an action has uh, occurred. We can do the same thing manually, of course. Let's click on the headphones. And when I click on the headphones, uh, not much is happening um, because this is one of the rare nodes I have which, han which doesn't interact outside of the rack. It has all the logic built on the uh, sub rack, so it doesn't need to do anything with others. Um, so it's just broadcasting to itself, so for others to observe that it changed state from address zero the register, so the register at zero was changed back to zero. Okay, cool. That's how I interact with uh, registers. And now we can do similar things with other buttons and for example enable my lab power supply and see that B5, uh, B5, the power uh, um, subrec sent to C5. C5 is my relay box to change at address 3 the value to 1. Um, and if we look at the register setup of the relay box um, relay Divide register three. Socket three was enabled. And if I do this again, it is disabled again. And that's how the system works with um, registers. Now there are some other functions besides handling registers, which is, for example, this interesting one, UI enable and UI disable. So as you see, this rack I have, it's quite illuminated, right? Um, so at night, it's not the best thing, or not at night, but watching, for example, a movie and having these buttons flash in your face, not the best situation. So I decided to have a dedicated command, which all my nodes respect, um, which is to enable or disable the UI. So if I say disable the UI, it sends a UI off command and all buttons 
turn the LEDs off. If I send an UI on command, all the LEDs go back on uh, uh, and show their state again. Um, right. So this is basic interaction with the system. What else do we got? Um, well, registers, another challenge I had. So let's do a bit more. Let's enable this one. This enables the um, LED strip in my IKEA furniture. And it tells it, uh, you can see one, two, three, or off. Um, so it tells it what kind of, or which sections in the furniture should be enabled. Uh, just the lower bits, some gradient or uh, full illumination. But I really wanted to control what colors uh, to use, how, how the brightness level is uh, and more. Now earlier I spoiled to never use RGB, right? So it would be quite obvious to send some RGB values across the bus um, to uh, set the colors and brightnesses of uh, these uh, LEDs. I decided against that because I think it makes way more sense to not work with RGB values but rather with HSI values, use saturation and intensity. Um, with that it's way easier to do nice animations which just change the U around the color wheel. Uh, something, if you don't know that, something to, to look up on the internet. Uh, uh, HSI and HSV are way nicer to handle. But it brought me a problem. I have multiple boards which handle LEDs. So I have these IKEA nodes, but I also have LED strip nodes. They are different, different hardware addressing different scenarios. Now, if I want all of them, let's enable an IKEA LED strip as well. Um, if I want to control both of these, how to do it. I could make sure that their registers are similar. So I can write a hue or saturation or intensity value uh, into the same register. So in a, if ever I'm dealing with LEDs, the first register is always hue. Um, and then I could broadcast that to a broadcast group where both of these devices are in uh, and they could listen for that um, and act accordingly. But if they are both in the same broadcast group, I can't do, for example, firmware updates in that broadcast group because they are di have different hardware. Mm, I don't really like it because they are not the same devices. I could use that, go that route, but uh, I decided against that. Um, rather, and I'm really not sure if it's clever, um, I made an exception. Um, so I have, instead of interacting with them with a command, so with the registers, we, we've seen before, we can directly write or read uh, the registers, I created kind of broadcasts, where I say, oh, there is a special command which says, this is broadcasting use saturation intensity and any device interested in uh, such values can act accordingly. So if I rotate these encoders, you can see, okay, I'm doing the intensity part, uh, the U part, the intensity and the, um, uh, the saturation and the intensity part. Not sure if that is really the way to go. But I will do a similar thing in the future with other broadcasts like uh, sensor broadcasts. What's the temperature, what's the time, humidity, uh, and way more. Um, they are just broadcasted onto the system, not direct directed at a specific node, uh, but rather any node being interested uh, in these kinds, the, these kind of information can listen for, for that and act accordingly. 
Right, so um, we touched upon registers. Yeah, let's try the automation part. Um, so let's say I want to watch a movie. And in the current setup, I have um, a few lights on. My sound bar is on. Let's turn that thing off. Um, let's do the emulation off. Let's say I have my desk lights on and I want to watch a movie. I don't want to have my desk lights on when I watch a movie. I want to. I want it to be dark, obviously. So now I created presets. So I have a preset module here. And that preset module is uh, working on the computer, working on the bench, watching a movie, having some mood lighting. So I have a button I can press to watch a movie. And for that I have a specific command which is called a um, preset here, a preset command. And it has one byte which is which preset was chosen. Do I have a list of the presets? No, I don't think so. Well, it's the presets I just mentioned. Um, and what is happening when I press the button is, and again, this is one of the design choices to make, if I click this button for watching a movie, what should happen? So we could either say, this guy knows how to configure all the other nodes on the bus. Right? It has one configuration uh, 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 saved and it knows which lights to turn on and which nodes to turn off uh, and which nodes to ignore. It could all be in this one unit. I didn't like that because the commands are likely different per node. Then it's likely that I have to hard code them in code. So every time I want to change uh, the behavior, I probably need to compile something and update a device. I didn't like that. I tried to go this route with presets. So broadcasting that everyone on the bus knows that a preset has been selected and now every node on its own will decide what to do. So if I click this button, it will just send a preset message, the one you see here, preset, and everyone will receive this preset and then act depending on their local configuration how to act in which preset. So in the movie preset, for example, uh, this power uh, uh, node here will disable the lights. But this IKEA furniture thing here will put on the lowest lights because I like to have some dim background uh, illumination. This guy will know that for a um, for watching a movie, it should go to some intensity level, but go to white only. Don't show any colors. That's disturbing. And the audio bits will switch depending on their configuration as well. So that's the idea behind it. If I have a preset, it's broadcasted and each node on its own decides what this preset means for its configuration. And that plays together with the registers, because the way I implemented it, I said, let's go back to the register list. Um, and let's go back to the audio thing we looked at uh, in the beginning. And I think it's uh, one of the simpler ones. So we said we have these registers, right? The first three are device registers, so interacting with the device. And then each node has registers related to the presets. So we have um, presets from 0 to F. And by definition, or each node can define how many registers it needs to configure a preset. And that is appended by if, if the preset is enabled or not. So let's, let's try this. So the audio uh, thing, it only needs to know if a preset is changed, which audio source should be used. It doesn't care about doing some Bluetooth connection trigger or how the default power on state is. The only thing which is interesting for this node is 
which audio source should I use if a preset is used. So I can configure this device via registers again to say, okay, preset zero, or we said about, we want to talk about the movie thing. I think that's preset three, I think. Um, so preset three, is it enabled or not? If it's enabled, we can save here which audio source it should use. So if this is uh, configured, and let's read that. Um, what was the device? B2, that was a read device, I think, yep. Um, so let's say from 0, 03, 0, 03, and let's read I don't know, 16 bytes or so, doesn't matter. Right, so if we look at the registers uh, being configured in this device, it's starting from byte uh, register number three, so from this one here. The first preset is enabled and it should put its source to the top one. If the next preset is uh, uh, selected, it is enabled and it should put it to default. If the third uh, preset, and that's the mood lighting, uh, is enabled, or the party mode, um, it should switch its output or input to the sound bar. Yeah, I'm at the output now. Um, and so on and so on. And if it's the movie preset, it should go to the output of the headphones. For all the other presets, there's no configuration, so it doesn't do anything. That way, I can configure everything again in the same way, because it's just registers. If I want to change a preset, I can just change the module I want the change in. Um, and it's quite uh, flexible, because it the, the configuration is based on the capabilities of each of the uh, devices. So let's try to press this button. I will press the watch a movie button. And a lot of things happened. Um, first of all, you see it's dark now. So mission accomplished. So what did happen? I sent a, or the preset module sent a preset command for preset 3, which is watch TV. And then a few things happened. Um, C from B3. B3 is which board? Uh, which address? B3 is, okay, the lights thing as expected. It turned two lights off, likely the desktop, uh, the lights on my desk. Then the uh, module which does the oh, let's turn it on it's easier the module which turns on or turns off the uh, UI uh, acted and turned everything off. Then B8 what is B8? Ah yeah um, the LED lighting was set to mode one which is the lower parts um, uh, in the furniture lighting. The B9, which is U saturation and intensity, sent a HSI command and set U to zero, saturation to zero, so there's no color, but maximum intensity, okay. And then I already clicked manually um, that was after uh, uh, this was completed, to turn on the UI uh, and all nodes are configured. If there is a manual interaction, invalidate the preset, it always jumps to FF, uh, because if somebody did something manually, it's no longer the preset. Let's do the same thing for another one, so I have lights back. Let's work on my desk. Uh, not much will happen, um, because in this configuration, everything is already almost there. Um, the socket was enabled here and the LEDs were disabled. And that's how I work with presets. So, 
now on to the last parts of the commands and that is how to flash a device, do a firmware update. Um, really important, uh, again it drives you crazy when you have deployed all these devices or nodes across your apartment and you have to update the firmware. You don't want to crawl behind furniture and have five meter long USB cables to do the flashing and it's all complicated. So remote, being able to remote update your firmware and your devices, really valuable. <clears throat> so hi, how am I doing this? Um, I have some scripts. Um, for each node, uh, I have a script to update its firmware. Let's take the audio thing again. Yeah, okay. And let's talk about how this work works in principle and then later on see it in action. So the what happens when I want to do a firmware update? The first thing which is sent is a specific management command which is TX disable. It tells every node on the bus to shut up. Because when there is a firmware update uh, uh, update running, I don't want to risk any collisions uh, happening on the bus. I really want everyone to be quiet. So I have a command TX disable. If I send that, all stacks uh, will stop sending data until uh, it got enabled again. Easy. Then I want to get the devices into the bootloader. So I need I want to reboot a device. Um, and we saw that earlier. I can send a, a reboot command. Uh, and the device will reboot and start with the bootloader. Okay, that's obvious. But um, there is a bit more to the uh, reboot command and to the following ones. You can see here earlier when we used it, um, let's see if I still find that here we rebooted a device. We just said FF. That's the command to reboot. But when I want to do a firmware update, I really want to make sure that I don't make any mistakes and flash the wrong firmware on the wrong device. So I have added the option to specify in some commands, which are related to um, um, the firmware update, to specify a board type and a board revision. So I could say we know this device rebooted, we know the first byte here is the board type and that is the revision. So I could say 0243 and it reboots. Okay, let's say I'm telling this device that I expect a different board. I'm expecting with 3 board while it is a 02 board. It should actually ignore that. Perfect. Let's say I expect to be way worse and have a way higher board revision. Maybe it's not compatible with the old ones. It ignores it. Awesome. So with these commands, I can filter out specific hardware to ensure that I really target uh, the devices I want to target. If you look at my script here, um, say the audio one, I specify for the firmware update the device, in this uh, scenario a device group, so F2, multiple devices, and I specify the board type and the board revision, and which firmware, which firmware to flash. Okay, so when, when I execute that, I sh we should see a TX disable, everyone should shut up on the bus, no collisions, a reboot of a specific device. Now, if a device reboots, we have around four seconds until this device leaves the bootloader. Or six seconds? I'm not sure. Once it leaves the bootloader, it can't be flashed. It has to be in the bootloader. So there is a command 
do not exit the bootloader command. FD. Let's try that. So I rebooted the device. The device device. Oh no, it didn't work. Um, I have no idea why the device didn't like that. Where is my Because it expects a board type and a board revision. I can't send data without uh, specifying which board is targeted. Okay, so it's 0243. So let's clear all this again. Reboot it. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, don't do things uh, live. It's of course the other way around. First the command FD, then the board type, then the board revision. Reboot this again. Send this a couple of times. And now the bootloader is told to stay there. Don't exit. Awesome. Now I have a few commands here. I can send a command to wipe the flash memory. I can send a command to wipe the EEPROM. And I have commands for the actual firmware data. Firmware data. That is more interesting because looking at the AVR, I'm not sure if I can find that quickly. It's somewhere in... Dum -dum -dum. Page size. Hmm. I think the page size of a AVR sixty four is two hundred fifty six bytes. So if I want to flash something, I need to send two hundred fifty six bytes of firmware data. Uh, to the device so I can f flash a single page. Now the challenge is in looking at our protocol 256 bytes, 256 bytes that's difficult. We have as you remember a length field at maximum it can be FF um, that is 256 bytes but there is more, right? There is the uh, recipients, there is uh, the command I need to tell the device that this is flash data coming, I have this board type and board revision, it's way too long for my protocol. And also I didn't want to reserve so much space in each node as a maximum length for buffers to allocate, I want to have it smaller. So what I do is I um, transmit chunks of a page. So a 256 uh, byte page, I chunk it down to 64 bytes and send four packages. And that boils down that the maximum length I need is 60, sixty-seven, sixty-four, uh, sixty-seven 67 bytes right here, uh, 67. So I have a board type, a board revision, what part of the chunk I'm sending, and then the actual data of the, uh, the, firmware, uh, of the firmware. And once I commit, uh, uh, transmitted the four chunks I need, so it's 256 bytes, I can tell the device to actually write uh, the collected chunks into one page and I can specify the page number. So this is my longest message and that specifies um, 
for all my nodes how the buffer sizes are calculated. I cannot send messages which are larger than 67. I would need to recompile uh, and flash all nodes to extend that to, to a bigger value. So let's see, let's try this. Um, let's try a remote update. Um, so you should see uh, once I start the update that um, the LEDs turn off um, because it's rebooting, it's in the bootloader, uh, no LEDs are driven there. Uh, and you should see the things we just discussed. Let's see. So TX is disabled. Everyone should uh, be quiet. Um, reboot these boards. They are up. Tell these boards to stay. Flash, uh, wipe the whole flash. And now we're sending data. And we are always sending the uh, chunks of data. And then a command to write it to a specific page uh, in the flash. And you can't see that because the image is above that, which is awesome. Um, so let's start here again. Uh, TX is disabled. Uh, reboot is um, requested for a specific board. The board's rebooted into the bootloader. We are telling the bootloader, stay in the bootloader. It's repeated multiple times in case the uh, message processing took some time. We sent a command to wipe the whole flash. We are sending the chunks of um, uh, firmware data. We are telling it that the chunks are now completed to write a complete page. Um, this is repeated for all the pages. And once we are done, we are telling the device to reboot. The device is reboot. It should be the same firmware as before, I guess. Let's check that in a second. Um, I tell everyone on the bus, okay, you are allowed to uh, speak again. Um, the bootloader has completed for both devices and they are configured once they boot up to do something on the bus, so they are writing a, uh, into some register. Uh, FCF, let's see, it should be the same firmware, I guess. No, the firmware changed. Oh, I didn't have the latest firmware on there. Interesting. Right, so that's how firmware updates work. And of course I was wrong a bit, this is future me. Um, the page size on the AVR is 512 bytes. That makes more sense because if you look at how the flashing works, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chunks, each uh, 64 bytes in length, which then sums up to 512 bytes. Uh, and you can see the chunks uh, with the chunk locations here, zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, and they combine uh, one page then, which is uh, 512 bytes. And that concludes the working with the commands and the low-level communication and the protocols. But there is another topic, which is collision detection and collision avoidance. Let's try if I can force a collision. So I know the E5 command, because it's quite lengthy and my timings are off, sometimes generate a collision. Ah, and a collision happened. So let's see. Um, so I asked uh, all devices to uh, respond to my request and for some reason receiver decode failed, no start condition. So at some point there was a start condition expected, but it didn't get it. Collision appeared on the bus. So let's check the stats. Um, what are the stats again? Um, bum, bum, bum. Stats request is. Oh, I'm doing a stats request. Um, so, so far, there were no receiver 
collisions or errors. Now if I do this again, I see that a few devices had multiple occurrences of, I would guess that the, this one is the start condition uh, uh, stats. So multiple devices uh, couldn't read messages on the bus because a collision occurred. So let, let's dive back into the draw IO, board, draw IO board. What is happening here? So we let's go back to the bytewise communication. Ignore all these long messages. Um, sake, for the sake of simplicity, let's look at a single byte. Because we have a challenge here. Let's say multiple devices want to send a message. And that's exactly the scenario we saw. It's a broadcast, so I'm addressing multiple devices. I ask them all for a message. They respond because they are, have similar stacks in almost the same time and all want to send something onto the bus. Now, the interesting part is, if we look back at the data sheet of the 485 transceiver, it says half duplex. What that means is, while on the bus we have this differential signal, which is fine, on the serial side we can either transmit or listen. With these pins we can switch the modes between I want to listen or I want to send data. So now multiple devices want to send data. The AVR has uh, hardware built in to automatically do this uh, switching between listening and uh, transmitting. So all you have to do is just say uh, the, the serial port sends something, it will automatically switch um, uh, the uh, transceiver into sending mode. And while it's sending, it's completely deaf. So let's assume this node is sending E1, this node is also sending something. There is a collision on the bus and it's scrambled and the message which is read by this node is completely, oops, is completely, uh, I hate IO, is completely random stuff. This node here, because we use this protocol, understands that a collision has happened or, it, or some noise happened. It doesn't know it's uh, really a, a collision, but it knows that the message is not right. Maybe the start condition is wrong. Maybe the checksum doesn't uh, uh, work out. Uh, maybe the length is way too long for a message. So it can detect it. But because we are using half duplex, the actual senders of this message, they are deaf. So while they are sending, they can't sense what is happening on the bus in parallel. So they don't see that a collision is happening. They can't detect a collision. If this would be full duplex and there would be, can I do this here somehow? No. Another Another connection where, for example, on this one here, it's transmitting, on this one, it's always reading back what has been transmitted on the bus. The node could probably detect that the message is garbled, but that doesn't exist in my setup. So I don't have any collision detection in these nodes. They don't know if something went wrong on the bus. But this guy here sees that something is wrong. Now I pondered if I should implement something where if this node understands that the bus had an error, that it sends a special command on the bus and tells these devices, hey, whoever transmitted last, your message was garbled. But of course, um, that could be problematic because we don't have one device, but we have multiple devices. They all would see that the bus has problems and would all try to send a command uh, which tells uh, these devices that there was a collision and this command then could also collide on the bus with another collision. So that's all terrible. So for collision detection, I have nothing. 
only the receiving nodes can see that a collision occurred, uh, but the sending uh, nodes are completely blind to it. So if I would redo this, I would probably use full duplex chips and try to read back what is happening on the bus so each node can figure out on its own uh, that the message was uh, garbled on the bus. So, so much for collision detection. I can't really do something here. But there's also another thing which is collision avoidance. Let's try to be clever and avoid to send uh, data when there is a collision or there could be a collision. Now, earlier I said spoilers, uh, I have to use timers. Exactly for this reason I have timers. And as you saw, they are not working reliable, so I have to probably rethink that. Um, maybe I'm doing something wrong. What is the basic idea here? Um, let's say if I want to send something, can I visualize this somehow? I don't know yet. Um, so if this uh, node here wants to send the E1, in the code you say, oh dear, C report, send the byte E1. And then at some point the hardware is processing that, the chip is uh, changing the um, uh, the transceiver into a transmit mode, uh, pushes out the data and then flips back to receive mode. So there is some time frame from the moment I'm my intention is to send data to the data is completely sent where this node will be deaf. And the same is happening for all the other nodes as well. So in my code I have a point in time where at this point in time, I need to know if it's good to send data now or not. And what I try to do is I created slots. So each of my devices have a device address. So this device address is unique. So I divide it, and I will not do it with 256, but a bit shorter here. I divide it, or I have a timer running, which counts through slots. Let's say slot one, zero, one, two, three. And based on the uh, address, Devices are only allowed to send data when their slot is happening. So if this one wants to send something, C1, let's say this is the slot for one. He can, if this timer slot is reached, he can send data. And the data takes some time, it's longer than uh, the other slots. But as the devices or the other nodes receive the data, they will see that their slots are um, occupied at the moment and they will ignore that. So let's add that here as well. So this is the C1. And this will be C2. So let's say we have these time slots. When the time slot number one is reached, C1 is allowed to send, then the, uh, uh, all the switching happens with the transceiver. Let's say this is a really short time. Let's say it only takes this amount of time to do all this. And since then, the bus is busy with data and all nodes see this data. So C2 knows even though it's my slot now, somebody is sending at the moment, I don't do anything till I reach my next slot. And then C2 is uh, uh, sending its data and this is repeated forever. Now this is in theory possible, but the problem is, first of all, 
if we have timers, they drift. So while from a C1 perspective, maybe this is uh, the order, the C2 node might, because of drifting or because they booted at different times, think that's the order. That's problematic because then uh, there might be a, let's say the message is a bit longer, the message is a bit shorter, then it would try, no, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, so they get out of sync. So what I'm trying to do is I sync them on receiving data. So every time somebody is transmitting something, on the last bit on the bus of a transmission, everyone resets their clocks and sets them, where's the last transmission here roughly, and sends them, uh, sets them back to zero. So that way, every time there is communication, and we know the problem mostly occurs when there is a broadcast, there's always a request first. So there is a message on the bus. It's not that we are idling for five hours and then suddenly two devices want to send data at the same time. Um, could happen, but it's unlikely. Um, it's always happening when somebody is requesting stuff from multiple uh, devices. So there is a request first. And once this request completed, we sync on that on the end of the message and all the timers start again at zero. So that way we should be uh, uh, in a synchronized state where we can wait for our slots to happen. Since I implemented that, it is way more re reliable and collisions uh, happen way more rarely, but I still have some either theoretical problem or an implementation problem could be related to interrupts or so, I don't know. Um, so this is not working as cleanly as I wanted it to be. But in the sense, this is uh, my approach to collision avoidance. At last, let's take another look on the functionality uh, uh, which this rack assembly is offering. So let's see what we got here. So you already saw this module here is enabling and disabling all the buttons for being able to uh, have a nice uh, movie experience. On the right hand side I have a debug module uh, it can request the stats from all devices and shows me the RX and TX errors. I will later remove this. This is just so I have an eye on if many collisions appear or not. Then we have the audio section. So we have audio input um, from my PC or my notebook or through this connector or through Bluetooth and audio output to my wireless headphones, to the soundbar, to the connector or Bluetooth. Then we have the LED section. Let's change something here. Mm, let's see if that works out. Okay, so I can enable the lower bits uh, of my furniture or a gradient or a full color. And then we have the saturation, so how much color or not is mixed into this. Oh, we should have the terminal open so you can see the messages as well. Yeah. So how much saturation um, is put into uh, these colors. And the intensity, so completely off. And when it's color, the U of the color, right? Okay. Um, then we have uh, LED strips, uh, which we 
I can't show at the moment, but it's the same thing to enable or disable them. And then I have a rainbow module to enable animations. So let's do that. And what we can do is do the speed of animations. We can do the width. So at the moment, both of them are in sync more or less. And across the whole room, I can specify how much all of them. Let's do this a bit slower. How far they are apart. So as you can see, while one is purple, the other one is greenish already, and so on. So that's around the uh, LEDs. Then we have, um, let's turn that off. Then we have our power sockets. So my desk lighting, my other lighting, a couch light you can see, uh, my label printer, my regular printer. These are, by the way, configured to auto power off after, I think, 20 minutes or something. My lab supply and my sound bar, you saw that earlier. Some of my projects, which you can see, I can at least enable the box here. So it shows all my other projects being active. Turn that off again. Then we have the presets. You already saw that. Uh, so working on my desk, uh, working on my bench, watching a movie and having some mood lighting. Uh, let's do that. You see tons of messages going around. It turns off all kinds of things. Put my power bar, uh, sound bar on. Put the LEDs into uh, animation. Enable the projects again. Things like that. Let's go back to a work setting. And uh, the buttons I like the most, but I need to be cautious now. Um, it's the master off, it turns everything off. So uh, it's again a preset um, and all nodes know that they should turn off. And there is a timer. Uh, I use this timer uh, when I actually go to bed. Um, I can click that and it will uh, uh, do a few things. Let's try that out. I'm not sure if you see that on the video. No, you don't. Can I send that over to the other screen? Oh, yeah. Um, it automatically uh, sends a request to my uh, Windows PC here to shut down. So let's cancel that. Um, and it puts on a timer. It puts on uh, a lighting on low intensity so that I can find my way through my apartment. And after three minutes, it will automatically, let's disable that because otherwise we are actually shutting down. Um, and if the timer is run out, all the lights uh, uh, and other things which are turned on will turn off. Let's go back into a working sale, working mode. And you see quite a lot of uh, commands have been sent around, uh, depending on the settings uh, or the, the inputs I have here. And that concludes my short lecture on how my completely over-engineered home automation system works. Uh, I hope you learned something. Um, for me, it was an interesting challenge. Uh, I learned a lot and hope to see you in my next project in uh, typically two to three years. Bye.